Okay, so as I said before, uh, I'm Evelyn and I am a career track group leader at the Quantum Institute. So, um, meaning tenure track group, group leader. So I'm um, in my day job, I run a, a group that investigates bacteriophages in the human gut and how we can use them to improve gut health. Um, but in my spare time, or also really a little bit part of my job, um, I work on bacteriophage taxonomy. And at the moment, I'm the chair of the Bacterial Viruses Subcommittee of the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses. So why am, why am I giving this um, introduction uh, to show you about virus classification, how it relates to taxonomy, and how we can use this for viromics? And I'll probably leave you with more questions than answers, and maybe the panelists will be able to um, solve all of those questions. So when we think of virus classification, that's basically in its simplest form is putting things in boxes. So you can see my, my marvelous drawing of um, different types of viruses that I've tried to put in different types of boxes of different types of sizes, and some don't fit and some do fit. And um, that, that's in, in essence what classification is. But what, what then taxonomy is, is then the science of this classification. And it's not just putting it in, putting stuff in boxes, but also naming them. So it's a combination of classification and nomenclature. So there are a couple of things that are specific about taxonomy of viruses is that we use now 15 ranks from realm down to species, and we have specific nomenclature rules and orthography rules. So practically, how does it work, um, virus taxonomy? So the taxonomy is done by committee, not by priority of publication, meaning that we have this international committee who has been given the power, so to speak, by the International Union of Microbiological Societies to, to create a taxonomic framework. So there's an executive committee that meets once a year, and then you have subcommittees um, that have their specific remits. So you can see that there's an animal DNA viruses and retroviruses subcommittee. I myself lead the bacterial viruses subcommittee, but there's others. They all have to, they all um, reign over their specific part of the virus sphere. Then there's also live members and uh, national representatives that um, eventually vote on proposals. So the process, how did, what does it look like? Um, in essence, you submit taxonomy proposals um, to the, the relevant subcommittee chair. So if it's a proposal about bacteriophages, you email it to me. Um, if it's about plant viruses, you email it to somebody else. Usually there's a bit of back and forth um, that is involved, but the deadline is usually around May each year. These proposals then all get put together and they get read by every member of the executive committee. They then meet in person or in the last two years, this was in Zoom, to go over all of these proposals, see if they um, provide sufficient evidence for this new um, family of genus or species that you want to create, and they give their approval. It can also be that they give um, minor corrections, um, maybe ask for more evidence, um, and then there's a period of time during which these corrections can be uh, processed. Um, and then those that had corrections to be processed um, get voted on again by the executive committee, and then all of the proposals that get voted accept um, go into another folder, um, and they will then be ratified by vote by the ICTP members. So this vote is usually in January and February of each year, where um, those executive committee members, the members of the subcommittees, the national member, the, the regional representatives, they can all um, vote um, yes or no on each proposal and, pr proposal, and proposals get ratified by um, simple majority. So all of the new taxa that are then uh, proposed end up in the new taxonomy update, um, which is published on the ICD web fee website. And there's two specific files, the um, master species list and the viral metadata resource that you can download as Excel files. And they have their own, uh, and they each year have the updated taxonomy. Now at each stage, you can um, get this all of the proposals from the website, um, meaning so we'll try to be as open as possible so that everybody who is interested could um, send comments. 
And it's also possible that proposals are withdrawn when you find a mistake or um, when they get voted to be deferred to the next year so that there's um, new evidence that can be um, gathered. So in the best case scenario, let's say you find a new virus, um, bacteriophage, any other type of virus, and it's part and it is part of a new taxon that you want to propose. And you do that in March, and you're just in time to make a taxonomy proposal that you submit in May, then it still takes one year after uh, before this gets updated in updated taxonomy and is, for example, um, listed as such on the NCBI taxonomy database website. Um, so when we look at, I'm of course, I'm, I deal with bacteriophages, so I always look at the bacteria infecting virus there first. And in 2017, uh, Rodney Briston from NCBI and myself, we wrote this paper, how to name and classify your phage. And then we were around here in the number of nucleotide phage records in NCBI, meaning um, all of the records, no matter how short or how long that were tagged as being phage. Um, we're, we're close to um, 100,000 now. Um, but then we also have um, the RefSeq record that you've probably all have heard of, and that's a subset of the records. And for bacteriophages, we have an agreement, my subcommittee has an agreement with the NCBI that um, the RefSeq database will consist only of the complete genomes that are uh, used as exemplars of ICTV species. So if we have a species um, of a phage um, of species of phages, some of them have multiple genomes associated with them. There will be only one of those in the RefSeq database and the others will be in the neighbor's record. So we can have the same look um, on the virus sphere for all virus records. Um, so you can see this steadily goes up. Um, but um, here, down here, are the RefSeq and the master species list number of species. So this um, is so low in comparison with this one, so that I thought I, I'd um, elaborate here. So we steadily go up with the number of species that we um, have defined. So I went into the historical database on, uh, on the ICTV website, and I pulled out how many species we had in 2000. I couldn't find the numbers for 2008 and 10, but to the, from 2009, we've basically gone from 2,000 official virus species, um, being any type of virus, to now just over 9,000 in the taxonomy release that was released in, um, I'm gonna say May of this year. Um, at the same time, you also have the RefSeq virus records. They don't completely match because for some, um, mainly eukaryotic viruses, there will be um, more um, viruses in the RefSeq records than there, are, than there are species just because um, their species bins are sometimes really big and contain a lot of viruses. So then the RefSeq will add more, um, but happy to chat more about this distinction later. So then we also have the IMGPR database and um, basically there's, you know, it, with the third release nearing a, a million VOTUs and, and almost 3 million sequences. And if you compare that to, to here, then you can see that the majority is unclassified. But that is not necessarily an issue if you know how to deal with this. So what's the framework that we can work in at the moment? Currently, um, ever since um, 2019, we have a 15 rank structure to divide the virus sphere in. And um, so before that, we had five ranks, um, species, genus, subfamily, family, and order. And we've extended that to start at the highest level, which is relatively comparable to Baltimore groups, if you guys know that, um, at the realm. And then we have, for the main ones, realm, kingdom, phylum, class, order, um, some of the, we have available sub classifications that we don't yet use, but we have them if we need them. So in 2019, we, uh, we had um, 5,560 species um, divided into 1,000 genera, 79 subfamilies, and 150 families. But at the time, we only had one realm, and we've expanded that since. 
So there are a couple of other recent advances and, and considerations that mainly affect viromic studies. So one of the things is that there's a consensus statement that was published a couple of years ago um, called Virus Taxonomy in the Age of Metagenomics, basically opened to the door to using um, genome records only to create new taxonomic um, assignments or new taxa. Meaning that from now on, um, you could make a new taxon from metagenomic data or virome data. The second thing uh, is what we've kind of put out in our roadmap for genome-based page taxonomy paper together with Dan Turner and Andrew Karpinski is that we wanted to go from the tailed phages that were traditionally classified into morphology-based families, being the myoviridae, photoviridae, cyphoviridae, based on their tail structure and tail length. Um, if you do that, then you can see in this tree, um, which is a prote proteome-based clustering, that in the inner ring, you can see the morphologies. And you can see that this is not, each of those families is not monophyletic. So what we're now doing and going forward, we'll do more, um, much more, many more families is we break open these pieces and create new families for each of them. But doing so, we also need to come up with new family demarcation criteria for each um, of these subsets. Because if you look at um, this tree, actually, um, it's on a scale from zero to one as a dissimilarity. So if you have a branch length that goes all the way down to the center, that means that you don't have any similarity between two um, phages on, on, on these branches. So, so if you have a um, myovirus on this side and a myovirus on this side, they, they share nothing in terms of their predicted proteins. That is important for viromics because if you put them all into the same bin when you um, do your analysis, um, if they share nothing, why are they in the same bin, right? So these two, these two papers kind of exemplify the, the road forward. So introduction of new taxa based on sequence data alone, alone and reorganization of morphology-based classifications. Now, this is the example for the tailed phages. Um, it is possible that this will happen in other parts of the virus sphere as well. For example, um, currently the rhabdoviridae family is um, based on bullet-like um, morphology of the, the, the virus particle. But if you look at the genomes, this is also not a monophyletic family. And we'll see what the rhabdovirus study group does with that in the future. So knowing all that, basically there's a lot of questions that, need, that we need to ask ourselves. So how do we effectively put viruses in boxes or in taxa? Which of these boxes are the most biologically relevant? And this may be different in different environments or um, depending on your research question. What are we going to name these boxes? If we have 1 million, then we need to have 1 million names. And what of these processes actually do scale for viromics? Because it might be easy to look at the genome of three bacteriophages and do it by hand, but if you have 3 million, that's a completely different thing. So the, the um, main take home message here is that no single tool or approach will rule them all. Um, and I wish we would have a one ring, but we really don't, or not yet. So the first thing that when it comes to classification, um, clustering, the, the first level that you can look at practically is the nucleic acid level. And I wanted to first start with uh, the example of double-stranded DNA viruses, which are uh, in databases are mainly bacteriophages, but can also be others. So Simon and um, when we wrote the paper on the, the UVIC standards, Simon did this really big um, analysis where he took all the viruses in the RefSeq database um, and aligned them pairwise with each other. And then you have the percentage identity on the y-axis and the alignment fraction on the um, x-axis 
x-axis and the heat map colors is how many genome pairs that you have and you could see these groups these clusters of okay um this one here you have 90 90 to 100 um nucleotide identity shared average nucleotide identity over 85 to 100 percent of the alignment fraction so this is this is kind of a, a meaningful clustering that emerges and here as well um and this was really interesting because years prior um in our subcommittee we had decided to use 95 percent identity over the complete genome length which is basically this group um as a arbitrary species barrier at the time. And um, it becomes even more interesting because at the same time, independent of us doing that, um, there's a lot of research from Matt's group that showed that this 95% um, number is biologically relevant, uh, especially in the oceans, um, where a lot of the research is being done. So if you're interested in that, I refer you to, to Matt's um, group's papers. So what we decided then, if you if you then compare this, um, if you do that with the whole IMGBR database, um, then, then you see that it's a little bit more fluid um, to use the cutoff of 85% ANI for over 85% of the quantic length um, for meaningful clusters for virums, or, um, for viral OTUs. Now, so this is roughly equivalent to the species level. So I like to use viral OTUs, VOTUs for species level populations in, in my papers. Um, we, what we did, what we do is um, for, for isolated bacteriophages, we're slightly more stringent um, in, our, in our clustering. But then we have the genus level clustering as well, where we um, use the 70% number because we've seen that gives the most biologically relevant clusters, but we, we do use that in combination with phylogenetics of certain marker genes, just to be sure. But of course, as I said, no one tool to rule them all. There's also no one threshold to rule them all. So, uh, you can use the pairwise sequence comparison on the NCBI website to just, um, this is unfortunately not updated for bacteriophages, um, but to look at some of the groups of well-organized um, um, other types of viruses. So, so I took out two examples. So this is a different way of showing that heat map of the previous um, slide, where you um, do again a pairwise comparison of everything again of all of the, the members of, in this case, the Picorna Verde um, viruses. And then you can see that um, for them, the species definition, it lies anything 65% um, nucleotide identity and up. The genus length is like clustered here between 45 and 65, and anything within the family is lower here with these peaks at, uh, at roughly 20% shared. Um, nucleotide identity. Now, of course, everybody wants to hear about, you know, SARS-CoV-2. So I did the same for the genus of beta coronaviruses, and you can see that it's um, way more spread out and stuff. So this is possible that, that eventually the coronavirus study group might need to, to reassess their um, genus and species boundaries, for example. If you were to do this analysis with all tailed phages, you basically have one big blob here saying that the majority of tailed phages share nothing at the nucleotide level. So there are some considerations to take into account when you do nucleotide um, clustering for your virums. Um, it's important, as we heard yesterday already, that you have complete genomes or that you know about the completeness of your genome. But it, then it can be used to create bins for a mixture of complete genomes and fragments where, you know, every, every small genome fragment that is 100% identical to uh, a, a complete genome can just be put into the same viral OTU. Um, and an important thing for automated analysis is that this is agnostic, uh, this clustering at the nucleotide level is agnostic of the, uh, the quality of your annotation. But um, when you have a virome, which can be a mixture of 
double-stranded DNA viruses, single-stranded DNA viruses. If you've done transcriptomics or if you've done a cDNA synthesis step, you can have you know, RNA viruses in there as well. So using one threshold to cluster everything might not 100% match the species definition. And in some cases, it might be miles away from the species definition. And this is just something to take into account when interpreting your data. So because the nucleotide level is, is um, not necessarily relevant um, at, at all ranks, uh, as we've seen that it breaks down after the more or less the family level, um, we can also cluster the proteome space. And because I know that there's people um, in the panel who are going to talk about certain programs, I thought I would quickly run over the basics with a different program um, that will not be discussed today probably, which is gravity. So um, the, the complicated plot here is relatively simple. Um, when I explain it, so you have your virus genomes, whether they're from the references or from your queries, um, you annotate the proteins, put them in clusters together, align them, and then um, create HMMs. And what in this, this um, program does differently than some others is it also created genome organization um, models. Basically, it would take into account the sequence of the proteins in the genome uh, consecutively. So this um, information gets compared pairwise to each other and then gets um, pairwise boiled down to one number, um, a composite generalized jacquard distance. And then you can create heat maps again. And these heat maps looked like that when it was first done. Uh, and um, so basically, this was for us one of our first evidences um, that we needed to split up and get rid of the um, families, my very, put a very cipher variety. This was yet another, we already knew we needed to do that, but um, this first one um, kind of proved it yet again. So one of the things that um, was done here is that. Um, Gunn, who created this program, he split his clustering and his models and his HMMs into six different groups um, representing different Baltimore classes. And this way he could um, basically get around the fact that some of these viruses really have nothing in common and have different evolutionary origins. So, in, in the sense of, okay, having one tool to rule them all, it would be better to have everything together. Um, but this makes it um, easier to process and interpret. Now, what do you need to think of when you do proteome clustering? One of the first things that comes to my mind, and it's because I've seen quite a few um, relatively bad um, GenBank files for phage genomes is, you are dependent on correct gene predictions for a lot of these. So what do you do? Do you just take all of the GenBank files? Do you take all of the RefSeq files, but then you, you have a smaller set of, uh, of genomes to work with? Or do you just automatically re-annotate everything? Um, these are considerations that you need to make um, when, when you do protein-based clustering, because somebody might, you know, um, annotate their genome with PROCA, somebody might annotate their genome with, with, uh, with RAST, um, and some, some uh, person might have used a pipeline that was completely not relevant for, for viruses and misses out all of, on all of the small ORBs. So most of the tools that, that are in use are usually independent of genome organization. So that's a, sometimes a piece of information that we miss out on to make a distinction between you know, different levels of um, classification if you have like a genome inversion or something. But um, usually it is not that much of an issue um, to find your threshold. Again, is there one clustering threshold to rule them all? No, no. Um, can, it, can this be made hierarchical? Um, sometimes yes, sometimes not. Um, and in, this, in the case of gravity, it is ridiculously computationally demanding because it needs to um, re-calculate um, 
all of its reference database as well and all of its models. Uh, so any any tool that you'd want to use with hundreds of thousands of contigs um, needs to scale. I know gravity scales up until about 50 genomes. Um, and, and I hope to hear from, from some of the other panelists that they scale into infinity and beyond. Now, the final level of clustering, I would say, would be phylogenetics and phyl phylogenomics. But the prerequisite for this is that you need to have a core or a signature or a marker gene um, identified in your set of um, genomes that you want to classify. So, for example, uh, I'm showing you an example for RNA viruses here from a, a metatranscriptome study. Um, and for, for RNA viruses, it's relatively easy because all of them have uh, an RNA dependent RNA polymerase, and then you can make beautiful um, trees um, like this. And this is straight out of the Sheadal paper. But when you do this, you actually do have to keep in mind if you put, um, so, and this was done in, a, in an earlier um, paper from the same person, that if you take your RDRP phylogenies, you may have this really nice, you know, clustering. But then if you take the capsid proteins from the same viruses, your phylogeny might look quite different. Uh, and this may reflect, um, you know, recombination in the lineages. Um, the, it, it might just be that there's they're just completely different, you know, um, evolutionary pressures on the different genes. Um, but I think most people um, are happy with their RDRP phylogeny. So I just wanted to share one example of where we used all of these approaches. Um, in, in the last year, um, where we defined a new class of uh, called Levivirus seed of RNA bacteriophages. Um, so, and this came about um, from a paper by Julie Callanan and colleagues, where they, I, so this is um, the, the, the Levivirus kind of um, standard genome. It's a, a short, um, single stranded positive sense RNA virus genome with three major proteins the, matur the maturase protein, the code protein, and the RDRP. And in some cases, um, depending on the lineage, there's additional uh, accessory genes that are found called, and they named them alpha, beta, and gamma. So, what they found is that there were three um, clusters of mat uh, maturase proteins and two clusters of RDRPs phylogenetically, um, and that you basically could very, quite easily um, define a hierarchical structure for these viruses. So that's what we did. And this is now um, in press, where we've defined the new class Levivirus, which is built on what previously was the Leviviridae family, and created two orders based on the RDRP phylogeny, and within those, we have new families based on the um, code protein um, phylogeny and used amino acid identities for uh, defining the genera and species. So you already know that every kind of group gets to pick almost their own relevant demarcation criteria because that's just what the biology um, shows rather than using the one threshold of 95% ANI. Um, and finally, I'm quickly going to talk about the taxonomy as babelfish. Um, so can ICDV act as the babelfish, um, which is a small yellow leech-like fish um, which feeds on brainwave energy and basically translate every other language into the language you know. And um, we've used this in crass like phages. Um, so if you're interested in this, um, I've, wrote, I've written an opinion piece on this um, recently on um, taxonomy, uh, the gut microbiome, phages in the gut microbiome from the perspective of a taxonomist. So if you look at all phages um, in a gene sharing network, that Ben will tell us more about, then there's this group of the crass-like phages. And the question often is, is crass phage the most common human gut phage? Well, if we then create a taxonomy for these crass-like phages, we can see that we actually have a new order of crass spiralis um, that contains four families. 
and where you have your original grass phage is somewhere here in the family intestiviridae, and the first isolated grass phage is in um, the family Stichviridae. So that now that we can say, oh, is, the is grass phage the most common phage? And then we'll probably say, oh yeah, grass viralis members are the most common in the human gut, um, but might not necessarily be the strain grass phage that was originally discovered. Um, I'm going to end off with some clarifications on common misunderstandings and a take home message. So what often is mis misinterpreted um, for viruses is that a virus species is just a bin like any other taxon. So it's, um, it might have biological meaning, but it is still a group of strains or isolates or genomes. And, and you do have to take that into account when um, using analysis that it's not one species, one strain or one representative. We're going to move to a binomial species naming process uh, using genus plus species epithet. Um, and I'm, I'm using some examples here. So if you have a species that's currently known as Salmonella virus P22, this will become Lederberg virus P22, where Lederberg virus is the genus and P22 is the species epithet, and its member is Salmonella phage P22. Now for phi cross one, so bacteroides phage phi cross one, um, this becomes uh, the species is assigned to the species Kehishu virus primaries. Um, so this is currently one member, one species. But if you then look at influenza A virus, which is currently the species, that will be become alpha influenza virus influenzae. And it currently has 792,529 members across all HN subtypes. So species definitions and contents are not always um, similar across the whole of the biosphere. Um, and I, I often use this analogy saying that all dogs, all domestic dogs are members of the species Canis lupus, but obviously they're not all the same. And don't forget to write your official taxonomy in italics. My final take home messages are, <laughs> Um, if you do classification and taxonomy, they are crucial in the interpretation of your microbiome data, but um, that doesn't mean that you don't have to take what you see with a grain of salt, especially when it comes to morpho um, morphology-based um, families. And if anything that's automatically generated, always be critical of it and look at your data. Use multiple tools, use multiple databases, and when in doubt, contact your friendly neighborhood taxonomist. With that, I'd like to thank my institute, my funders, my team, uh, and everybody who has done a little bit of work that has ended up in this presentation.